Good evening, God bless you. And again, welcome to Calvary Grace. This is our evening service and it's Mother's Day, 2023. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray that you'll bring this alive, that it'll touch the hearts, the minds, and encourage the people that are listening. Let them be blessed. Give them ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. Exodus 34, verse 29. And it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he'd spoken with the Lord. And when Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses' face, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. And after the Israelites came near him, he gave them the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, or pardon me, yes, and when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. In this passage, we see something quite amazing happening to Moses. He's 40 days and 40 nights on the top of the mountain with the Lord. And the glory of the Lord, the, 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 the presence of the Lord appears all the way through the Bible to manifest itself as light. And it so penetrated him, so radiated into him, it began to radiate out of him. Out of your belly shall come rivers of living water. There's a sense in which when you've spent time in the presence of the Lord, it flows out of you. And here is Moses. He has spent 40 days and 40 nights without food or water in the presence of the Lord. And when he comes down and they look at him, they're terrified. You know, we always kid about microwaves and the fact that it causes things to glow in the dark. It really doesn't. But could you imagine if it did? Could you imagine what it would be like to be around people that literally glowed in the dark? Moses' face was radiant. Now, that doesn't mean that he had a radiant smile the way we would use it today. Today, if somebody has a very happy, magnetic sort of face that draws us to them, we would consider that radiant. But that's not what's being referred to here. Here it is literally glowing, shining. So much so that he has to put a turban on his head and a veil across his face because he's scaring the people to death. But when he goes back into the presence of the Lord, all that comes off and he just basks in in the sunshine of the King of Kings, the light of the glory of God. And then when he comes back out, he brings the message that God has given him and he passes that on to the people, but he must mask up again. We know a little bit about masking up, don't we? Having just come through COVID. Well, with that in mind, turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And what we're doing here is we are preparing for a scripture to come that has been a little bit hard to understand and we're going to understand it because we're laying the groundwork. 
in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. This is a passage we read every Christmas time. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. An angel, not the angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Evidently, this angel had been in the presence of God. And as a matter of fact, he brings a message from the presence of God. And it just seems like what the passage is telling us is that this glory was tangible. I've preached on the glory in the past, and the word typically used is kabod. It, it means the weight of God. It's kind of like being tucked into a bed with a heavy blanket on you. A sense of comfort, a sense of protection. The heaviness, the weight, the presence, the kabod. It's the Hebrew word for it. And it says the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now the Lord is not there. So how is the glory of the Lord shining around them? It's because the angel from the Lord has been in the presence of the Lord and carries that glory on him. And yes, as far as we know, all angels are hymns. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. So those that saw this saw the angel appear, but they also saw a visible representation of the glory of the Lord. It's no small thing that your Bible opens up with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, the first thing that he creates is light. And he defines it and separates it out from the darkness. And all the way through your Bible, those that are in the know are considered to be those that are in the light. And those that are without the knowledge of God are considered to be those in darkness. And we see such a consistency in this thinking. The glory of the Lord shone around them, but the Lord isn't there. The angel is there. How is the glory of the Lord shining? Well, could God just send his glory? Absolutely, he could. He could make it appear right there. But typically, we don't see God doing anything like that. It, it seems that his glory shines from beings. And so we have this angel appearing, and the glory that he's been exposed to is now leaching out of him. It's leaking out of him. And it's so bright, it's so powerful, that the shepherds are literally and actually terrified. And the angel delivers the message that you've heard every Christmas time. Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation 21, verse 10. Revelation 21, 10. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And he showed me the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, as clear as crystal. Here we have now not only angels and people 
shining with the glory of God, but the actual city coming down out of, out of heaven that God is dwelling in. And his glory is shining through that city. By the way, when we finish the book of Daniel, we're going to come back and we're going to do the last two chapters of Revelation. Because when you see the stones that the city is made of and you realize that the brightness of God, the glory of God is shining through that, you get an idea of the colors that would be displayed in heaven. It's going to be absolutely spectacular. But again, the glory of God is shining. Shining. And it's shining because of the presence of God. In Revelation 21, 10, we just read that. Pardon me, Revelation 1, this time. Chapter 1, verse 12, we read this. And I turned around to see the voice of the one that was speaking to me. And when I saw, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Now, when you read son of man, it means human being, someone like a human being. His hair or head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. I hope you're starting to get the sense of where this is going. Around God, there is no darkness. He is enveloped in light. And we would also recognize that as glory. The glory of God shines, and the Bible talks about it. Remember the story we just read a minute ago of the shepherds and the glory of the Lord shone around them. There is a connection between the glory and light shining. You know, we, we know now, medically speaking, the importance of the sun. We understand that it's aging. We understand that it can cause cancer. We understand all that kind of stuff. But you must understand also that without sunshine you will not create vitamin D. And it's becoming such a center of the health movement. They're starting to understand the necessity for vitamin D, and it comes from the sun. By the way, some of it comes from what you eat, and some of it can come from supplements. But the main producer of vitamin D in your body is sunshine on your skin. The shine, the glory, the presence, it's all intimately connected. And in the word of God, those that were in the presence of God shone. Moses had to cover his face when he came out because he shone so much it scared people. The shepherds, the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven shines with the glory of God. And the Lord Jesus himself in the book of Revelation shines like the sun. Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you'll die. By the way, God didn't say that. She's added to his word. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. When you eat of that fruit, you will have crossed the one boundary and you'll understand not just good, but you'll understand evil as well. You'll be just like a God who has the power of both good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, you know, we went out the other day and I was not trying to find this, but I accidentally came across a gourmet donut shop. A gourmet donut shop. I wasn't trying to find it at all. But we found it. And gourmet donuts turn out to be very good, though not good for you. When she saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. She looked at that fruit and she said to herself, you know, this looks good, smells good, and just think what I'll learn by eating it. I'll become like God. And she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And here's the part that is strange. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man said, uh, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man, said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the Lord said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten? from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, this is what, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. And the passage goes on with the original shame, blame and regret. But what I want you to see here is the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Now we don't know how long Adam and Eve had been alive together before this transpired. We know that Adam is created first. We know that at a certain point God puts him into a sleep and takes a rib and fashions Eve. But how long had they lived together naked and never realized they were naked? What happened? What transpired that suddenly they looked at each other differently and realized there was no covering? Could it be, is it even a vague possibility that since they walked with God in the cool of the day, they too shone with the glory of God, just as did Moses and the Lord and the angels? Could it be that while they were in perfection, the glory of the Lord shone out of them And it wasn't immediately visible that they were naked, for they were clothed and bathed in light. But now suddenly, there'd been a step away from that perfect state, and the glory of the Lord had departed. The kabod had become ichabod. 
There's a great story in the Old Testament. It's not a story. It's a factual occasion where the glory of the Lord leaves the temple and goes out through the gate and disappears. And a sign is put up over the temple to say, Ichabod. I means no. Kabod, glory. No glory. And it was Ichabod until the coming of the Holy Ghost. They realized they were naked. Something transpired. Something changed. The glory left them. And they now realized they were naked where they had been covered in light, bathed in light. And imagine what that would be like. Imagine being able to walk in the darkness of day or night and be able to see because the light emanated from you. And then one day, the light switched off. The kabod was now gone, and they realized they were naked, and they tried now to come up with a synthetic covering. I've seen a lot of people try to manufacture the kabod. So many ways they try and whip it up. But either God has put his kabod in your life or he hasn't. Either God has put his glory in your life or he hasn't. And if he hasn't, you need to come to Christ. And finally, God says, who told you you were naked? How, how did you figure this out? Have you eaten of the tree? He knew immediately sin was involved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we read this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly the sound like a blowing or violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire or cloven tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Fire. Why, why fire? Why wouldn't it be water? Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So is oil. Why wouldn't it be oil? Why would it be fire? Is this a picture of the returning of the kabod? Is this an image of return of the glory? As it comes into the room and divides into portions and sits on those who will be called the temples of the Holy Ghost. Do you know the Bible calls you the temple of the Holy Spirit? And if you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the kabod of God is in you and upon you. Oh, I'm not suggesting that you can now see in the dark. We still live in a fallen world. But there is a glory that comes upon people that are saved. There is a glory that comes upon people that come to know Christ. There is a glory that falls upon people that come to understand the Holy Spirit. And where we once walked in darkness, we are now walking in the light. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. We see a little bit of this during the life of Christ. It says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up onto a high mountain. And they were there alone. And there he was transfigured before them. Now that word transfigured is the Greek word metamorphe, metamorphosized, if you will. And his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. In Matthew chapter 17, you don't need to turn. In Matthew 17 too, the, uh, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun 
and his clothes became as white as light. In Luke chapter 9, verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. And back in our passage... And there appeared before them Moses and Elijah who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said, Rabbi, it's good for us to have been here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And they didn't know what to say for they were so frightened. Notice every time this happens, people are, are terrified. They're, they're terrified because it's so out of the ordin, ordinary. Here is a man that they thought they knew. Here is the Jesus they thought they knew who walked them up the mountain that at some time reached back and helped them up. And finally, when he gets to a certain place, there he literally begins to glow with the glory of God, shine brighter than the sun. And not only him, but his clothing. The kabod shining through him. I think it must have been hard for him to keep that under control. I think it must have been a difficult thing for him to walk around in this world with that covered up by his flesh. The glory was so magnificent in him and upon him. And it's not until we get to the book of Revelation where he has taken the veil of this off and is able to show the glory bright and shining like the sun itself. Well, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, we read the story of the first martyr in the Bible. Let's just say the first martyr of the disciples excluding John the Baptist. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Now Philip was a man full, uh, pardon me, now Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power and did wondrous miracles and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freemen, just as it's called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexander, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they couldn't stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. They were secretly persuaded by some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people of the elders, the people, pardon me, and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. And they produced false witnesses to testify. This fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Excuse me. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. And when they saw his face was like the face of an angel. Suddenly Stephen, who is full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of grace. And when they look at him, it's evident he's been in the presence of God. They argue with him, but they can't win. Because it's the anointing, it's the Spirit of God speaking through him. And when they see his face, it's the face of an angel. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they heard this, by the way, Stephen is going to give them a great message. Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and, 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 said, uh, and saw the glory of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father of God. He saw the glory. There he is. His face is already radiant. He's reflecting the glory. And as he looks up to heaven, having preached the final sermon, the glory is literally there in front of him and he sees it. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. By the way, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. For him to be standing, it was a mark of honor that he would receive Stephen, the, 
the first martyr of the, the disciples, the first martyr of the church, he stood to receive him. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, and they rushed him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. By the way, you know him as Paul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said that, he fell asleep. The glory over and over and over and over again. Shining from people that had been in the presence of God. Well, Saul, who was Paul, who saw this transpire, saw the glory, had his own experience with this glory, by the way. As he's on the way to round up the Christians from a particular city, suddenly a bright light appears above him and says, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he's struck with blindness. And he will tell that testimony several times in your New Testament. The bright, glorious presence of God. So now, let's listen to this man who has seen the glory. There used to be an old hymn I think it might have been the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let's listen now as a man that saw the glory applies that to your walk with Christ and mine. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Now, if the ministry that brought us death, which was engraved in letters of stone, on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily on the face of Moses because it's, of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? What did he say? He said, now listen. When Moses came down that mountain, bringing the tablets of stone, it came with a glory. In fact, it was so powerful that the Israelites couldn't look on his face without being terrified. So if that message that brought death and destruction, the law, could come with glory, how much more glory comes with a message that brings life. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. What did he just say? It just said, listen, what we've got has surpassed what they had. They had a message that pointed out their sins. We have a message that shows us a righteousness that is by faith through Jesus Christ. The message is our righteousness comes from him and is by faith from first to last. The message is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For what was glorious back in the days of Moshe, back in the days of Moses, has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? See, when you get saved, God comes into your life. 
There's a glory that increases, not decreases. Eventually, Moses no longer needed the face coverings. Eventually, Moses' glory faded because he was not in the constant presence of God. But you are. For he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we're very bold. We're not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Do you remember, in fact, maybe some of you are wearing watches still or have clocks that have a little phosphorus on the numbers. And what you had to do with that is hold it up to a light and charge it up. And then it would fade throughout the night, but you'd still be able to see your watch and see the dial because the phosphorus would hold the light for so many hours. So it was with Moses. He had been in the presence of God. He literally glowed, but it was a fading glory. We're not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing on it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains over the old covenant as when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only Christ has taken it away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil covers their hearts. They don't get it. They don't understand it. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, with unveiled faces, reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Listen to that again. And we with unveiled, unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. You know, the longer you walk with the Lord, the more you should show the glory of God in your life. It should be evident. Because we with unveiled faces shine his glory. In the creation story, God creates not only light, but he creates two sources and kinds of light. He creates the sun, and then he creates the moon. Now the sun is the source of light, but the moon is the reflector of light. And we are like the moon. We reflect the glory of God. We carry his glory. We carry his kabod. And we reflect his light into this dark world. We are not the source of light, the sun. Jesus, spelt S-O-N, is the source of light but we are reflectors of the sun and we shine his glory. What happened in the garden where suddenly they turned around and said, hmm, we're naked. I suggest something that was covering them was taken away in that moment of time. They that up to that point had been bathed in light now realized their nakedness. And they tried to cover themselves. There's a lot of religions out there that realize their nakedness. And they try through form and pomp and circumstance to cover their nakedness. But it's still all Ichabod. 
the glory has departed. And what they need to do is come to Christ, repent, get saved, and enjoy the kabod of God, the glory that will increase in the life of the believer up until the day he calls you home. And then it will be absent from the body and present with the Lord, and you will be dwelling in the glory from then on. It's a remarkable story. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have ordained us to wear your glory, to bear it and to wear it and to walk in it. Lord, not necessarily a visible light, but a radiance that comes from knowing Christ, a change in the life. Decisions are different. Directions are different. Thoughts are different. Huh. We are born again. This time, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And we have become temples of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and manifests in us your glory. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.